Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're gonna talk about bullet train. So let's dive right into it. Well, first, what we are talking about, we are talking about a railway system that is built for speed. So basically, there are many railway systems, many types of railway system. They have each unique, dedicated kind of uh, use case scenario. Basically, some European systems are built for uh, tourist systems. So they inherently are designed to be slow. They are inherently there to enjoy the scenery, to, you know, to, uh, you know, feel the experience. Now, there are other systems that are designed to be as cheap as possible because people need to afford that thing. There are systems that are like, you know, kind of balanced between like an affordability and speed. And then there are these puppies, high speed, as fast as you can go, the end game over. That's the whole point of it. That's how it is like, you know, the first blueprint is laid out. It's like, how fast can we go? So if you start with the thinking about speed and you end with the thinking about speed, then you are talking about a high speed railway system. Now, speed must be above 200 km per hour. Now, be mindful nowadays that is like actually a very low bar because almost even average quote unquote train has finally started to reach that kind of speed so at this point in time people are expecting you to run at 300 kmph and uh, able to reach around 350 kmph now one another aspect of it is very serious specifically uh, with countries that have large railway networks is that your actual service speed must be high for example you may have a scenario where this one railway train has the authority has the horsepowers has everything that it needs to go fast let's say it's uh, driving speed is capable of touching 200 kmph but here's the deal it leaves this platform nobody is expecting it to go at that very fast but it only waits uh, like you know uh, it only drives at let's say 80 kmph or 120 kmph and then it waits for reaching a one specific street where there's like going yellow but that's not the reality of high speed network a high speed network must be at that whatever speed that is specified for example uh, you go into tgb it's average speed like no this is like how we are driving most of the time that would be let's say 300 kmph you go shinkansen that would be the same thing so your actual service speed must be high. Another aspect of this uh, thing is that the moment you start to exceed 200 kmph, you become the fastest ground-based commercial transportation there. Because again, buses are don't uh, not known for going ludicrously fast and not to mention you can't even drive them that safely very well. Again, roads are not designed, like they are not uh, built for that kind of speed. So fundamentally speaking, this will be the fastest way to go from point A to point B using a land-based system. Many people have phobias regarding aircrafts and many people have uh, genuine pain when they are inside aircraft because of uh, sensitive ears so again if you don't uh, suffer from any of those awesome for you but many people do suffer them and for those people this would be a godsend and you would be surprised like if you have a very large population you may find out surprisingly large number of people would be like uh, even if this is more expensive they're like dude shut up and take my money i just want to drive on this uh, there is a very tangible physical reason for that now let's talk about rolling stock basically anything that moves basically the train now stability is the main issue because uh, we have been developing railway system for almost 200 years at this point in time so we know how to make those the only difference happens once you start to go at high speed is oscillation basically it starts to go ding 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 you do not want that that's the biggest issue like uh, when people started to actually do testing wheels was just randomly leaving the track it's like nope nope so that hunting oscillation was a serious issue and basically whenever you are looking at a bogey of a high speed system versus a normal one there won't be too much difference only difference would be this will be fine tuned in such a way that it can compensate for that oscillation or it could even have active system to handle that puppy that's the main thing you have to make this stable everything else is like we already have solved that issue another aspect is we want to make this train very light as possible now that is a bit counterintuitive because again if you're familiar with the electric locomotive we have so many times uh, electric locomotive have giant uh, basically lid of it put on them so they can have traction and again because uh, the friction spot basically where the steel is touching that steel on the wheel and the track that's so small if you do not have enough quote-unquote down pressure you will simply slip your wheel will simply start to just grind it away so there is a reason you do not want your wheel to randomly slip you need some oomph behind it so why the heck you want to make a train that is lightweight the reason for that is uh, not top speed is acceleration and deceleration so if you have a given the same horsepower even a heavy train will reach the same top speed depending on the aerodynamics. It will just take longer. But think of it this way. You have to start and stop train a lot. Again, specifically, this was a very big deal with the Japanese system because they were, uh, they like as a high speed link, if you look at a European system, they are like, okay, it's going through a town. It's going at okay speed, okay speed and bam, it goes at a ludicrous speed for very long miles. Like, like almost like 150 kilometers, they will be like nothing to worry about. But in Japanese system, okay, first stop. Second stop, it almost feels like a high-speed metro. So fundamentally, you need acceleration and deceleration. 
for that lightweight is necessary now you made your train lightweight now you have the same issues like how the heck the wheel will start slipping so generally all these high uh, high speed systems utilize electrical multiple unit now how uh, you know divided that puppy is that depends on the system because uh, in earlier european system they could not risk uh, going all out like japanese people did they were where they are each bogey basically bogey is the set of wheel that you see and you sit inside the coach each bogey had the uh, driven systems basically every wheel was a driven wheel so fundamentally that gave them ludicrous high uh, basically ability to dump energy into the track very efficiently so think of it this way like how a car that has four wheel drive will always have better traction same thing happens on a train also so european systems in early days they did not attempt that they simply relied on their long straights to like okay we're gonna have the locomotive and we're gonna go yolo on it then they started to realize yeah that's really not that feasible then they started like put one in front one in end then one in between then they're like okay we just give up just use uh, you know normal bogey with as many bogey as uh, powered as possible you may find a different mixture of that scenario where it's like hey every other bogey is powered it's not necessary where you have to every single wheel has to be powered it's just like large amount of them has to be powered so electrical multiple unit is a very efficient way of dumping power into the tracks now there is another advantage of that while it does increase your total train weight the concentration of that weight is very gentle so it's not like you know okay uh, engine is going your track is like eh, i can barely hold it on to like okay i'm relaxed now so instead of that big uh, dip your train is like little bit dip, simply because the weight is spread out more each bogey has a bit more uh, weight of motor transformers and all that jazz so it's more uh, basically gentle on the tracks so these are the fundamental things that we have to think about when you are talking about rolling stocks that go for a high speed system now let's talk about the main reason why you don't see it everywhere infrastructure now this is the primary expenditure of a project everything else at this point in time would be chump change it would be like dude i don't even count to that it's like you take a budget less than one percent would be spent on the rolling stocks like that's how expensive these things can go and if you go into any land conflict and any political hua god save you because this puppy if you are ludicrously lucky if you are idiotically efficient as uh, efficient as uh, basically uh, chinese people which exceeded the efficiency of japanese people the so reason was like you know japanese people uh, they built it first so they were learning a lot chinese people had the advantage like dude you do it first or you do it better so they did it better so they they are almost able to touch 10 million dollar per kilometer now european system good luck at that kind of price you will generally be at 50 million the reason is just buying that land has so much who have that's the biggest reason why america is unable to do that like the amount of money spent just to get the goddamn land is bonkers to say the least even though it's government it's like one division of government is talking to another division of government and to another division and you just burn through four years of time just on that like that's the thing that we do not think about it too much in day-to-day -day life is that red tape is a very serious issue and this is one thing they uh, basically uh, people of uh, china realized very early on it's like no we cannot have this much red tape so they are like okay this person is responsible of taking care of this and he will have ultimate authority and if something goes wrong he he will be sent to the chopping block so the idea was very simple one person takes care of all and it's very efficient and they standardize everything land permits everything everything had a, like a format they spent time on making that format and then they standardized it throughout the country so everything was like uh, this okay f wait five minutes uh, stamp done go home now everything was mind-bogglingly fast and then construction industry all those things they uh, made sure it's optimized only then they are able to reach around the lower end of that you know 10 mile per kilometer european systems are ludicrously expensive they can easily reach up around 25 to even more than that so that's the reality and especially if you're talking about a big country like a usa where it has freaking three time zones or australia which has multiple time zones you will be in a scenario where the track length would be so high it's like yeah let's just stick to with aircrafts so that's the primary aspect another thing that uh, japanese people finally figured out the sole reason high speed network was never working anywhere in the world was it was always sharing the network with three things basically you have uh, your express service high speed system then you had your com uh, normal uh, basic stuff and then you had your freight corridors uh, so basically three things were trying to use the same system so the japanese people were like nope we have to build a new independent isolated system just to take care of one thing high speed passenger service that's the sole reason they managed to make it work and to make them obstruction free now this is the more uh, expensive reason of that because train while they are flexible if you want to run them at speed you basically have to give them a straight path like they can go around curves they have a lot of curving tracks but and they can manage it it's just that if you either you do that or you uh, basically uh, make a straight track if you make a straight track you can go fast if you make a curvy track good luck bye bye speed at that point in time even with a tilting train you cannot go, really go very fast so 
and uh, achieving obstruction free simply means every road has to be either sent down or up through your highway every and not to mention the reason why you won't do the, the railway tracks is simply because the gradation must be remain very constant it has to be like track it cannot be like twing, twing, twing. you do not want to do that so fundamentally making sure that is achieved that is very very expensive that like that requires the amount of road permits is like okay you have to talk to this uh, council to do about this road system this this like idiotically mentioned and then uh, once you actually have that it's not like okay once you figured out all those things you just build a normal system you still have to build something very high end for example you have to make ballast free track the reason why you have to make it ballast free is because while ballast do shake a little bit when train is going but if the train is going a very high speed aka around 150 kmph plus it starts to break that like it's physically each gravel basically going from this big and that's very dangerous that basically fundamentally starts to make the track very loose so at very high speed this uh, it's very dangerous so fundamentally speaking so you will never have gravel tracks or high speed system so you have to have ballast rate now good news about this uh, is that while it is ludicrously expensive to build they are also very high uh, basically rigidity basically they do not shake too much and if you build it correctly it's gonna be like maintenance free don't think about it for 50 years it's like build it and forget it then we come to crossing aspect because these wheels are under so much stress you want to be gentle with those wheels it's like wheel relax calm down so every crossing has to become swing nose crossing now if you are in ever traveled in indian rail or any watched any video from inside the coach you will see you will know that train uh, the bogey is going through a uh, basically crossing it will go kadung, 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 kadung. you will always know that guaranteed you will know that the reason for that there is a giant gap in this uh, basically the joint wherever that joint is that is unacceptable if you want to make sure your wheel last longer it's not that a wheel cannot uh, handle that impact it's just that it's gonna degrade fast and even minor impact on a minor dent on a wheel which is going at 300 kmph that could turn ugly very quickly so they have to have swing nose now this looks very weird it's like the whole track is going no nope, i have provided a video down below please do check it out and uh, that itself is just one step then you have to have a basically radio signaling you cannot utilize a basically red uh, yellow and green signal it will simply not work it's too slow so fundamentally all these systems are automated to nth degree and they are utilizing radio signaling so even if a, a driver misses a signal the train will be deployed uh, you know with emergency braking without any issue you do not have to think about it. it's almost automated at this point in time so that's a compulsory thing then we come to continuous as welded uh, rails so each rail is made as long as possible in the factory from day one that's how uh, basically long they can make it they make it then they weld multiple of these things and these things can go long like ludicrously long before they actually have expansion joint where they have like you know a diagonal slit so they even in those uh, location your wheel does not go through unsupported section so infrastructure wise it's ludicrously expensive and whenever you see these things you are just seeing the surface layer because be below this layer there is like jound foundation laid down sometimes that foundation could have like gravel rocks and like sometimes even cement uh, or sometimes even concrete to just like you know make sure you have a stable ground because you can if you are going through let's say a place that is a very uh, earthquake -prone, if you don't have good foundation every earthquake will just basically wonker your uh, basically mess up your tracks so that's why infrastructure is ridiculously expensive now we come to the economics aspect of it now this is the reality part this is the part that bitch slaps most of the people is that if your country does not have gg amount of uh, gdp do not even think about it like you can try to think about it like vietnam did uh, but yeah the moment the bill will start to come or even the projection will come i'm not talking the overrun cost overrun i'm just talking the minimum projection that any um, organization that is worth their salt is gonna give you you'll be like no thank you so that's the whole thing you have to understand this is ludicrously expensive and it's rarely profitable even in japanese system only some links are profitable and those links are basically carrying the weight of most systems that are not profitable that's how idiotically expensive this puppy is so why the heck invest in this well reality is it allows you to move people now people are resource of a country it's not uh, basically minerals or anything like that it's people if you have people you have money if you don't have people you don't have money so this is the logic of china it's like hey we have beijing okay capital we got all the quote unquote it sector all the factories everything is there but you can't cram too many people in one city fundamentally you cannot do that and you will notice that with uh, let's say new york bangalore or uh, all every major city will know a point where it's like dude it's too choking at this point in time yes there are factories yes there are business it's just like living cost is so damn high and people are crammed so tightly it's almost suffocating and it's not good for people productivity goes down and it's like it becomes hyper competitive for even a small thing it's like this rent is like you know 50 million dollar for one square bedroom what happens so 
you want to spread out your people for health also and for productivity also so imagine it this way you built a system uh, that if you can afford a two hour travel time you can have this whole ring of transport time whereas like you can literally work from your uh, small village and go to office daily um, utilizing a high speed rail network this was uh, pioneered by japanese people so china realized that 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 is the most critical aspect if you can move people from point a to point b efficiently enough reliably enough lot of new opportunities comes up think of it this way let's say you work in a scenario where you don't have to actually work for a very long time let's say your work hour like whatever you are doing you are barely needed for four hours let's just say there are some jobs that are like no you only have to work for this let's say you are talking about a doctor or surgeon it's like he can be anywhere like anywhere he could be like in three hour ring where he's like you know he comes in the morning and he can be comfortably living in his a very calm peaceful environment of a small town so you can understand that and like if you are able to endure six hour travel or heck you can sleep in the train you can travel anywhere so that's the whole point if you can move people from point a to point b it uh, basically reduces strain on your major cities allows expansion without uh, suffocation those are really awesome things now one thing china did amazingly well it was the what we call playing the long game stimulation of economic growth think of this way china realized very early on is like either they can do what india is doing is like buying uh, trains or locomotion from everywhere else or they could start to build it on their own now there was a, uh, another benefit of that is like if they start to build it it's not something that even like, okay uh, we'll start the factory and tomorrow we're gonna have that no it will take five years minimum but here's the deal to building the tracks will also take barely five minimums so they started all these projects parallelly and they even had uh, went back to colleges university and like okay they laid the foundation of which uh, like over time like over five years they are like okay we now we have engineers engineers are ready we are good to go factories are now complete the production starts we are ready good to go tracks are complete first trial runs can be done we are good to go so that's how they build it so efficiently and that's what the economic uh, benefit of that is like every factory that was open and because these factories uh, require you to have high uh, output rate otherwise like there is no point making a factory that only makes one train you have to make 50 systems they had to make more system while they were running in debt they were creating an infrastructure that will outlast them they were creating an economic growth everywhere people can move from point a to point b they were creating factories jobs infrastructure colleges university all those jazz so basically it was investing on a very long term it was like they were going down 10 billion dollar and they were coming up like you know few uh, billion dollars like almost one trillion dollar was spent in this sort of project and everybody's minimum assumption is like they made at least three trillion dollar out of it not directly be mindful directly it's a negative system but uh, if you look at the secondary benefits it's like bro shut up and take my money so let's talk about India. Now, India and Japan is have, going through what we call technology transfer. Basically, these two people are coming together and they are, are you know, learning from each other, figuring things out. And Japan is helping, in, uh, helping India to build its own high-speed network system. Now, while that is being going on, uh, another backup project, not backup, I would say side project has been uh, started that is dedicated freight corridor. Now, you have to understand this very thoroughly. India has large population, as in idiotically large population, which means every... A ticket has to be surprisingly low in terms of cost which means uh, railway has to move a lot of people for very little amount of money and that's just not profitable flat out railway passenger division negative is just the question is how negative it's like hey dude we almost negative five percent awesome that's like that's party time for them it's like negative five percent awesome like on an average year it would be like negative 25 or 25 like just to give you a rough idea or estimate so to say so railway makes most of its money from freight systems now freight system are falling behind simply because to compensate for large population they are putting more train more trains same network congestion like the only thing you're going to delay is your freight system of course you're not going to delay your uh, basically passenger train so fundamentally freights are falling behind side effect of that more more and more freight is trying to be uh, diverted through trucks side effect trucks consume diesel diesel is a national resource you do not want to spend that and not to mention it also degrades your highway system so everybody loses so dedicated freight corridor was created for idea was very simple they're going to give you a reliable system where it's like dude ship your transport uh, basically actual bulk good from point a to point b utilizing the system you don't have to think about delays you don't have to think about rising cost of diesel you don't have to think about it. it's like it's a reliable uh, accountable system so to say and that uh, uh, government has already opening small sections of it and they are already starting to have some uh, early uh, estimates coming in and they are like yeah this will make money so that's a really good investment system. and they are directly learned from japanese systems so they do not have crossings uh, they try to remove as many rail crossing as possible like most of the network train does not have to stop down there is no railway crossing most of them either uh, the local traffic is diverted below or the train is diverted above so fundamentally if you travel in those lanes because there are many places where the railway track is next to normal passenger track so you can see that is like damn 
It's like you don't have to think about it. It's like these trains, they can just go here low. And not to mention, while India has uh, electrical catenary wire system, basically uh, electrical overhead, it was designed for a normal system. So they can only carry one container. But to have bulk freight, you have to have dual containers. So India may be uh, only place in the world where you can have dual containers on an electrified system. So that's the whole point. Like a uh, dedicated freight corridor, it's a good thing. It's almost uh, reaching a point where it will start to generate some profit. And again, it's a huge project, huge. Or oh, has to connect like multiple large section of India to be tangibly beneficial where people are like, no, instead of relying on uh, basically trucks and all that, we'll rely on this, which has to be a very good thing for the nation. But what about the passenger service? Again, it's a very long and expensive road ahead because uh, let's say for example of uh, Mumbai to Ahmedabad, the reality was because India is a plateauless region, like there's a lot of plateau, it's not flat. It simply is not flat. So the only solution to have a high speed railway network which goes at high speed, you have to have elevated system. So it's like everything is on a bridge. Benefit, it will be very flat for the train. Side effect is going to be ludicrously, idiotically expensive. So it's uh, still to be like seen quote unquote like uh, how good the system turns out to be but dedicated freight corridor is really good time tested it, it works like it's already starting to show that it can actually work and actually make profit you do not want to say take india and like okay now india is under the debt of uh, like you know soft bank so uh, we still have a lot uh, of room to basically improve so this was my presentation about uh, bullet train. I hope you liked it, learn from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friend, that will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I'll try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free, and as always, thanks for watching.